2 Samuel 21 is our text, is where we find our text. We're dealing with verses 1 through 9. 2 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 9. Let's hear God's word. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the presence of the Lord, and the Lord said, It is for Saul and his bloody house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the sons of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the sons of Israel made a covenant with them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah. Thus David said to the Gibeonites, what should I do for you? And how can I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? Then the Gibeonites said to him, we have no concern for silver or gold with Saul or his house, nor is it for us to put, away, to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, I will do for you whatever you say. So they said to the king, the man who consumed us and who planned to exterminate us from remaining within any border of Israel, let seven men from his sons be given to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul and the chosen of the Lord, of the chosen of the Lord. And the king said to them, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath of the Lord which was between them and between David and Saul's son, Jonathan. So the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, and Ammoni, and Mephibosheth, whom she had borne to Saul, and the five sons of Merib, the daughter of Saul, whom she had borne to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholothite. Then he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the mountains before the Lord, so that seven of them fell together, and they were put to death in the first days of the harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. The reading of God's word, I'll be seated as we go to the Lord to ask his blessing on its preaching and its hearing. Give us eyes, O Lord, to see what the Spirit has inspired in the writer of Scripture. Give us ears to hear and understand and know and do all your holy will. By the help of your Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Second Samuel chapters 15 through 20 record two rebellions against the Lord and his anointed, King David, the Christ figure. The first was a longer-lived Revolt led by David's own son, Absalom, recorded in chapters 15 through um, 19, which tragically ended in Absalom's death. The second, a short-lived uprising, was undertaken by a worthless Benjamite named Sheba, which ended when the people of Abel, Beth Ma'akah cut off the rebel's head and tossed it over the city wall into Joab's waiting hands. The moral of these two accounts is don't mess with Yahweh. Not wise to mess with Yahweh, the Lord, Jehovah. 
If you mess with Yahweh, you yourself are going to be destroyed. If nothing else, that message surely comes through loud and clear in these two accounts of rebels against the Lord and his anointed. Chapter 21 begins by reporting a famine in the days of David, verse 1 says. So here's a general reference, and, and by this general time reference, the writer keeps us from assuming that this episode in chapter 21, verses 1 to 14, followed chronologically the events of chapter 20. That's not to say that chapter 21 is a, a, a standalone text. There's a definite structure found in the final four chapters of 2 Samuel. More about that next Lord's Day, a Lord willing. It's only to say that the, the writer doesn't place this famine in any tight time sequence. The famine happened sometime during David's reign. It has been suggested uh, that what the writer says in verse 7 uh, about Mephibosheth is a hint that David had already brought Mephi Mephibosheth um, Jonathan's son to live at court, to live at the palace in uh, Jerusalem, 2 Samuel 9, before this famine took place. But it seems to me that that's not even clear. Chapter 21 begins a brand new uh, of, and, and a final section of uh, Samuel's narratives. At the end of the previous section, 2 Samuel chapters 9 through 20, is marked by this summary um, that we read last Lord's Day, that we dealt with last Lord's Day of David's administration in chapter 20, verses 23 through 26. It's the same way, if you'll recall, that the first section, of uh, chapters 1 through 8 in 2 Samuel, uh, were ended and the new section uh, was begun. There was a similar summary of, of David's administration there at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 8. This is the way that the, the writer of 2 Samuel has structured the Samuel narratives. He deals with each major figure. He deals with Samuel himself. And then there's a summary of Samuel and his ministry. He deals with Saul's kingship, and then there, there's a summary of Saul's kingship, and then there are these two summaries of, of David's kingship. It helps us to uh, at least put things in order to see somewhat the structure that, uh, that, that the writer has set out here. The first 14 verses of, of chapter uh, 21 have a covenantal flavor about them. These verses are teaching us something uh, about the covenant. There are several lessons here, several, several things that, that we learn concerning covenants, God's covenants, covenants that, that, that God's people make uh, with others and the oaths that they take and what it means to break these covenants. And that's what we'll be dealing with uh, in these first 14 verses. And tonight, uh, in verses 1 through 9, we'll be looking at two of those things that, uh, that this text teaches us about covenants, namely covenant mercy and covenant atonement. Covenant mercy, covenant atonement. Now, this first point, covenant mercy, is a point that's easily overlooked, verses 1 and 2. As the account begins, there's a problem. Something is clearly wrong in Israel. The famine in the land had gone on for three years, 
And note uh, in verse 1, year after year, the narrator says, it's his way of telling us, of cluing us in to the fact, uh, alerting the reader that there's an issue here. There's a difficulty in Israel. This ongoing famine might have signaled uh, that Israel, uh, to the alert Israelite at least, to the spiritually alert Israelite, that, uh, that, that they as, as a nation had, had done something to give offense to the Lord. We know that, uh, that God brings such things against God's people. We have records of, of such things, uh, of famines in particular, Leviticus 26, 19 and 20. And then uh, at the end of Deuteronomy, remember this is just before uh, the, the conquest of the land. Um, and there are uh, God, uh, Moses lays out, God through Moses lays out there to be blessings that are be, to be pr pronounced upon uh, Mount Gerizim. There are curses uh, to be pronounced upon uh, Mount Ebal. And one of those curses had to do with a famine. Uh, uh, famine that would, that would be brought upon the land should uh, Israel disobey. Deuteronomy 28, verses 23 and 24. So there's a problem, but David was in the dark concerning this problem. So he sought the Lord's face. That's what it reads here, literally. He sought the presence of the Lord. He sought the Lord's face for an answer as to why Israel was, was experience, experiencing this uh, prolonged famine. And the Lord answered in verse 1, the end of verse 1, it is for Saul and his bloody house because he put the Gibeonites to death. Now who are the Gibeonites? In case we've forgotten, the writer inserts a parenthetical note for us in, chapter, in verse 2, as if to say, you remember that story in Joshua, in uh, the account of, of Joshua and the, the conquest of the land, uh, chapter 9, as we have it uh, in our Bibles. During the conquest of Canaan, uh, when the kings of the land were gathering to fight against Joshua, the Gibeonites heard how Joshua had handily defeated the cities of Jericho and Ai. The Gibeonites were inhabitants of the land, but they tricked Israel's leaders into believing that they were from a distant land and into making covenant with them and protecting them by wearing worn out sandals and worn out clothes and putting uh, dried out bread into worn out sacks and uh, putting wine into torn up wineskins. And although they deceived Israel about their residency, the leaders of Israel did swear, did make covenant, did swear in the Lord's name to preserve them so they had no choice but to grant the Gibeonites immunity, despite the fact that the Lord had commanded them to wipe out all the inhabitants of Canaan. But now, years later, Saul and his bloody house had put the Gibeonites to death. This sin isn't recorded for us. Uh, anywhere in the records that we have of, of Saul's reign. So we don't have any further details, but we do know that in doing so, he violated Israel's covenant. He violated the oath that they swore to preserve the Gibeonites. Swearing an oath in the Lord's name and then violating it brings shame upon the Lord's reputation. It's taking his name in vain. Swearing an oath in the Lord's name also means that the swearers ask the Lord to bring the curses of the covenant upon them if they fail to keep the covenant oath. 
That's what's happening here. Saul's killing of the Gibeonites violated the covenant oath that Israel had made. The Lord's famine inflicts curse or violation of this covenant oath. So the issue here in 2 Samuel 21 isn't just blood revenge. Now that's what my, um, this English Bible, this translation has uh, as a, a title over this chapter, Gibeonite Revenge. Now there is blood revenge here to be certain, but that's, this chapter is not merely about, about blood revenge. The covenant has been violated the Lord's name has been desecrated. So there was a curse on the land because of Saul's infidelity. This is a brutal account. And we're going to consider its brutality in our second point. Yet can you not see that the Lord's mercy is imprinted from uh, upon this account, from its very outset, he doesn't keep David in the dark about why there was this famine on the land. When David seeks him, he plainly reveals to him what's wrong. The Lord reveals guilt. Mercy makes guilt clear, which is essential if guilt is going to be atoned for. In J.B. Pritchard's work, Ancient Near Eastern Texts, there's a pitiable piece from a, the late Babylonian period, which the translator entitled, Prayer to Every God. The worshiper prays to all gods and goddesses, both those he knows and those he doesn't know. Some god or goddess he believes has inflicted illness and suffering upon him, but he doesn't know which one he's offended. And he contends that this Miserable agnosticism plagues mankind as a whole that no one can know whether he's committing sin or doing good as he lives out his life. That's classic paganism. Nebulous, hopeless, and cruel. What if God left us in the dark? Think about that for a moment. What if God left us in the dark? What if he didn't reveal that his wrath and curse abides upon sinners for their sin? How hopeless would we be? But the Lord is merciful, isn't he? He reveals our guilt to us in his word so that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord for mercy, uh, the mercy that, that God offers in Christ has their guilt taken away and their sins atoned for. That's great mercy. That's marvelous mercy that God has told you and me that we're guilty before him and we need atonement, covenant mercy. That's the first thing I'd submit to you that our text teaches us. But that leads us to the second thing, does it? doesn't it? If there's guilt, then that guilt needs to be atoned for and that's exactly what's going on in our text. There's covenant atonement in verses 3 through 9. Now the, the problem has been revealed. Now David knows what the, the problem is. What's to be done about it? That's 
That's the question. That's the next question. And that's what David asked the Gibeonites at the beginning of his uh, interview with them. Verse 3. What should I do for you? How can I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? Isn't that an interesting prospect that these Gibeonites who are not part of the inheritance of the Lord would bless um, the inheritance of the Lord? How does that work exactly? Gibeonites' response in verse 4 has two parts. First, they say, in essence, this isn't a case to settle out of court. Saul's silver, Saul's gold doesn't mean anything to us. That's not going to make reparation for what's taken place here, for the lies, for the blood that Saul has spilled. But then second, they recognize that they don't have the authority to put anybody to death, to put any Israelite to death. So they're saying to David, you have to authorize it. You have to allow us to do this. And David presses them to get to the point, verse 4, the end of verse 4. Tell me what you want, and I'll do it. And they tell him, verses 5 and 6, uh, the, the man, they say, who consumed us, And you plan to exterminate us. This uh, tells us something about what Saul was doing. We have very little information about what Saul did, only that he killed us us Gibeonites. But uh, here we're reading that that Saul had this plan to exterminate this race, to wipe them out from the face of the earth years after this, uh, the the conquest of the land, years after um, the Israelites had made covenant with them. To exterminate us from remaining within any border of Israel. Let seven men from his sons be given to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. That may be somewhat surprising to us. David says, I'll give them. He consents. He selects these men from Saul's house, verses 8 and 9, and he hands them over to the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites then uh, proceeded to carry out their gruesome solution to the problem. Most of our English translations read, they hanged them, verse 9. But the Hebrew text is difficult. And some, uh, upon evaluation of that text, argue that the men were put to death and then impaled and put on stakes uh, to be exposed. Others... uh, believe that they were dismembered there after they were put to death. And as we later, uh, as we in a moment work through the the, the ritual commonly used in a connection with um, the covenant oath uh, that that Israel took, uh, you, I think we'll see why that might make sense. Note verse 9, though. They carried out this act before the Lord. Before Yahweh, before the eyes of Yahweh, they're putting these seven sons of Saul to death in this gruesome manner. Now, why was that necessary? Why is it, why is this gruesome action necessary two reasons in the first place Saul's killing of the Gibeonites polluted the land with their blood in numbers 35 33 says atonement cannot be made for the land on which blood has been shed except by the one 
who shed it. That restitution for blood is to be made by the one who shed it. But remember, this isn't merely about blood revenge. Secondly, Saul's offense violated the covenant oath. When the covenant with Gibeon was made, Israel's leader, uh, leaders in the, in the ritual uh, by which covenant oaths were uh, enacted asked the Lord to bring wrath upon them, to bring curse upon them if they should break it. Joshua 9, 15, remember Joshua 9 is that, uh, is that passage that deals with this oath that was made with the Gibeonites. Uh, 9, both uh, verses 15 and 16 in Joshua chapter 9 informs us that Israel made a covenant. Literally, they cut a covenant with Gibeon. So in this ritual... This covenant ritual, an animal was, was slain, it was cut up, its pieces were uh, put opposite one another, and those taking the covenant obligation upon themselves would walk b between the pieces of uh, this cut up animal, thereby saying, as this animal is cut up into pieces... So may we be cut up if we don't keep the covenant. If we don't keep the covenant oath that we have just made. You can see how it might make sense that, that these seven sons of Saul's were dismembered before the Lord. At Saul of Gibeah. You can find, uh, by the way, um, that that ritual is spelled out for us in Jeremiah chapter 34, verses 8 through 20. So they're taking this oath. It was a self-maledictory oath, a self-cursing oath, in other words. And the Gibeonites were now demanding by what they were asking of David that the curse be carried out upon Saul's house, upon these seven sons that, that David has given to them. It was God's wrath, however, that stood behind Gibeah's, uh, Gibeon's request. God's wrath brought the famine, and God's wrath must be appeased. The curse of the covenant must be carried out. That's first and foremost why this gruesome action was necessary. Saul, who carried out the carnage, was in the grave, and he couldn't personally suffer the curse, so Saul's descendants must do so. They became, as it were, the covenant breakers who stood in the place of Saul, who stood in the place of Israel, who made that covenant with the Gibeonites. The question that arises here, and I, I can hear that question circling around in uh, someone's mind even now. How can the Lord permit this? How is this permissible in keeping with the Mosaic law? Doesn't this fly in the face of Deuteronomy 24.16? Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, and children shall not be put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sin. Isn't this a violation of that principle in the Mosaic Law? Well, the easy answer is no, because it's sanctioned by God. It was done in the presence of the Lord, it was done before the Lord. And after this gruesome execution took place, and after these seven sons of Saul were staked up, the Lord took the famine away. 
the land. It appeased his wrath. The curse was satisfied. His wrath was atoned for. So that's the, that's the easy answer. The reasoned answer is that Deuteronomy 24, 16, which I just read, fathers shall not be put to death for their children, children shall not be put to death for their fathers, regulated individual criminal cases, while Saul broke the covenant, not merely as an individual, but in his office as a covenant king of Israel, representing the people of Israel. So this is not an ordinary, uh, an ordinary uh, criminal circumstances uh, where it might be attempting to put fathers to death for the sins of their children or vice versa. Saul's offense had a representational character as opposed to an individual character. And to that extent, it uh, involved Israel, the nation of Israel, in the guilt. The offense itself was national. It, had, it was a, of, a, of a national a nature as opposed to an individual nature, uh, since the covenant with Gibeon was sworn by uh, Israel's leaders on behalf of Israel's people. Should that covenant be broken, all Israel would be liable for it, even if only her chief leader was the instigator of this killing of the Gibeonites. That's the longer reasoned answer, and that may uh, leave still some questions unanswered. Uh, for you, that may not, may not satisfy all of your questions, but nevertheless, um, I, think that's a, I think that's a reasonable answer to the question. Most readers are aghast at the horror of what took place here at Gibeah of Saul. And that points us to the primary application of this text. We should be aghast at what's taken place here. It should shock us to the very depth of our being what took place here. The text says that the act of atonement is horrifying. We need to see this because we, oh, perhaps uh, those of us in the Reformed faith, uh, more than anyone, I suppose, easily fall into the trap of, of regarding the atonement as a doctrine, as a concept, a, a bit of theology to be analyzed and, and explained. But atonement is gory. It's gruesome. New Covenant believers have a, a better theological vantage point for understanding the atonement. We can make the connection between the bloody sacrifices of the Old Covenant administration and Christ's New Covenant sacrifice on the cross in the new covenant administration. Uh, we understand the substitutionary character of uh, the old covenant sacrifices, seeing them as a foreshadowing, a foretelling of uh, Christ's substitutionary atonement upon the cross for, for sinners. But Israelite worshipers understood the horror of the atonement better than we do. When a young bull was, was taken to the tabernacle or uh, the temple, its throat was slit. It bled out on the tabernacle or the temple floor. It was skinned, and then it was cut into pieces. The priests 
knew the horror of atonement better than any. The temple was a slaughterhouse. And they were the holy butchers of that slaughterhouse. It was a mess of bloody gore. From the slicing of the bull's throat in Leviticus chapter 1, 3 through 9, all the way to Calvary, God's revelation shows that the atonement is repulsive and horrifying. Christians must beware of, be of becoming too refined, longing for a kinder, gentler faith. This is what brought uh, liberal theology's unorthodox views of the necessity of the atonement. This is what brought the liberal theologians of the 19th century to proclaim that the atonement really wasn't necessary after all. That Christ didn't have to die for sins. But even those with orthodox views of the atonement can lose their sense of the gravitas of the atonement that Jesus Christ offered for sin on the cross. If we've grown too used to Golgotha's cross, maybe what took place here in Gibeah of Saul can shock us back into the truth. Atonement is a dripping, bloody business. The stench of death hangs heavy wherever God's wrath has been quenched and the curse of sin has been removed. The problem that occurred during David's reign in those days of the famine, year after year, points us forward to the greatest problem for every human being, deliverance from the wrath and curse of God. Jesus is the great high priest. Jesus is the priest extraordinaire who offers himself as the sacrifice, as an atoning sacrifice to save us from God's wrath and the curse of sin. God displayed him. Remember the way Paul expresses this. Romans 3, 24 and 25. Uh, displayed him as a propitiation. A turner away of wrath. By his sacrificial blood. To justify those who receive him. By faith. The repentant sinner's atonement. His covering for sin is secured by Christ's identification with the very curse of the law. Remember Paul again, Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. And if we felt the horror of these events in the days of David's reign, we'll be less likely to take lightly the cost at which we've been saved from God's wrath and curse. The horror of Jesus' death is beyond description. The agony that he experienced upon the cross is far past our comprehension. Remember what Luther cried out when he read and he was pondering what Christ cried out, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? God forsaking God, Luther said. How can this be? And if the horror of Jesus' death is beyond description, the consequences are unfathomable. By it, we who believe, we who have put our hope, our trust in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the Savior of sinners, are saved from the wrath and curse of God due to us for our sin. There is horror here, to be sure. The atonement is a horrible business. But dear Christians, there's joy here for everyone whose sin has been covered by that atoning blood. Amen. Oh, Father, we merely pray that you would help us to grasp something of the grave nature of Christ's atonement. That we might never be guilty of, of taking that atonement lightly, of theologizing it. Impress upon our hearts the horrifying character of our Savior's atonement for sin. And give us joy at the same time, even as we grieve the death of our Savior, even as we mourn over what he experienced for us on that cross. Flood our hearts with joy and help us to fathom how what seems to us unfathomable that the wrath and curse of the Almighty that once resided upon us has now been removed. And we are yours. You are ours. Thanks be to you, O oh God, and to Christ Jesus our Lord, whose name we pray. Amen.